Praise Him with the lyre and the harp. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with strings and flutes. Praise Him with clash of cymbals. Praise Him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes. Are you breathing this morning? Are you breathing this morning? Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen? So if you're breathing today, then I expect some praise to come from your lips. Amen? Let's do it. Josiah, please come grab this woman. This is all about Jesus, y'all.
church. Receive it. without hope no place to be in your love made a way we let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed beauty remained My open heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over. Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Come on, sing it out. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in my life began. That's when death was arrested in my life began. is over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you song of all the redeemed. Come on, there you free. Yeah, we're free. Any free. Forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, we're free. Free. Forever, we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free. Free. Forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. In my life began. That's when death was arrested, and my life began.
your name up in this place. God, we thank you. You have no rival and you have no equal. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I thank you, God, that everything surrenders at your name. Every knee will bow at your name. God, <laughs> we are amazing. No matter what's happening and going on, God, your glory is so great. You are so good all the time. God, we surrender to your will right now. 
We sit at the feet of Jesus right now. We pour out our hearts and our life right now at your feet. God, we bind the enemy from this place. We bind the enemy from our lives and our family. God, right now in the name of Jesus, we speak your name, that your name reigns free. Your name, Jesus, is above everything else. God, right now, I thank you. God, that there's a hedge of protection around our lives, that you paid a price. God, you poured out your blood of your son to save us in all of our sin. God, you chose us. So right now, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the joy and the freedom that we can stand in right now, knowing that the enemy is defeated. Thank you, Jesus. The veil was torn for us. The veil was torn so that we could have a way. The veil was torn so that we could come straight to the throne room of God and we could ask what we need. And we could know, God, that you are there to deliver us, restore us, heal us, and make us new. And Jesus, right now, we're asking for a mighty move. We're asking for the blood of Jesus right now that's already been poured out. God, that you would move in us as we're your vessel, Lord Jesus, as we open up heaven's gates right now, that we ask you to move and to change us, God. To align us with your will, Jesus. Oh, Lord. I thank you right now for the authority that you give us. The authority to bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. To bind him out of this place. To bind him out of our homes and out of our hearts. He has no place. God, we are so filled with you, with your desire, with your spirit. There is no place for him. There is no place in God right now. God, we ask you to open our eyes. If we're giving a foothold to the enemy right now, God, open our eyes to see that right now in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for the authority that we have in your name. The authority to speak your name. That mountains move, that things change. Chains break at your name, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We stand right now in the joy of the Lord. We stand right now at your feet, Jesus. We thank you for the mighty move. We thank you, Jesus, for revival. We thank you now, God, that you're aligning us with your will. God, that we step out, that we are a vessel. God, that we open our, our arms, our hands. God, that we step out in faith. God, have your way. Have your way in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that we are covered by the blood of Jesus right now. And that any time the enemy steps foot, God, that we can declare that we're a child of God and that we're covered by the blood of Jesus because he has no place, no foothold in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I challenge you right now to just align yourself with his word. Align your spirit. His spirit lives in you. Align your mind and your heart with that spirit that he's already given you. Align yourself with what he's speaking to you. Cast out any thought that is not in line with his word. I thank you, Jesus, that we just have the authority right now, the authority to cast out the enemy and the things that he does, the lies that he tells us, the sickness that he tries to bring, we cast that out in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God, that you are our healer, our redeemer, our savior, our strength, our joy, our refuge. You, God, are what we need. We thank you, Jesus, for that right now. Use this time during this next song. If you need prayer, 
If maybe you just need to fall at the feet of Jesus, right where you are or up at the front, whatever he is moving in your heart to do right now, I challenge you to keep your mind and your focus on him, on the words of this next song, on his holy presence. Because he wants to move. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants your thoughts. He wants to change your situation. He wants to move on your behalf. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. No, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. No, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe just want you. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do, I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you. 
Nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do. receive right now in Jesus name I thank you God for every heart right now that surrendered to your word I thank you Jesus for every request Lord God for every tear that was shed right now God that you see every tear you see every heart God you see our thoughts God you know our heart and we surrender to you God we know that in the many choices of life. We have so many choices before us. So many different things that we can do in so many ways that we can go. But in all your greatness, God, you you gave us one choice that would change everything. And God, when we choose you, our lives change. When we choose you, our paths open up before us. When we choose you, love reigns free. When we choose you, healing pours out. God, we know who you are. And even when we forget sometimes, God, you always show us. Jesus, right now, I pray that you are here and you see our hearts. And God, you see that we choose you right now. We choose you. We choose your way. We choose your love. We choose your forgiveness. We choose your mercy. We choose you. Reign free reign free in this place, reign free in our lives and in our homes right now in the name of Jesus. We choose you. Thank you for making such a simple choice for us. God, that when we choose you, you work things out. And I thank you for that. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this place today, right now, for each and every person that's here. God, for every heart that was poured out, God, that you're making ways right now. You're changing things. You're working things out. Our emotions and our feelings are submitted to your word. The enemy is bound in the name of Jesus. You are free to reign. You are free to move. You are free in our lives. In the name of Jesus. God, we thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, for loving us, for making a way. Thank you for allowing us to choose you. 
thank you for your love and forgiveness in our lives. We praise you. Thank you. God, we give this service to you, every part of this service, God. And for the words that are going to be spoken, that have already been spoken, God, that they're yours. They're yours. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you that your truth is spoken in this place, that your love is spoken in this place. And God, I thank you. I thank you, God. When we're pushed, when we're squeezed, when we're barely hanging on, that it's your name that we call out to that we know where our strength and our hope comes from, it's in your name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, thank you. We praise your name. God, we stay in this heart of worship and this heart of surrender. God, we thank you for moving and changing, changing us. God, because you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But God, change us. Align us with your word and with your will. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, that we can give in tithes and offerings this morning. In that heart of worship, God, that we can just cheerfully give into the kingdom of God. I thank you, God, for the vision and the wisdom, the things that are happening. God, for the dreams right now in the hearts of the people in this church. God, that there are visions from you. I thank you, God, that it's only by you, only by your name, that these things can happen. And God, I just thank you that you give us wisdom and vision for this church and this community in the name of Jesus. We thank you for all that you are. God, we ask you to continue making a way in this place and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, praise God. Yeah, yeah, hallelujah. Uh, the kids, don't mind coming forward? Have all the kids come up. I'll uh, pray a blessing. And uh, Chip, if you wouldn't mind bless, blessing the children. Uh, I'll give you... children here to hear today, Lord, and we just pray, pray a blessing upon them, Father, as they hear your word today, Lord, may it, may it just run deep in their hearts, dear Father, and we just thank you for every family that's here, that's represented here today, Lord, bless them, and Lord, we just pray that, that your word will just, um, the seeds that will be planted today, Father, that they would um, harvest a, a wonderful harvest, Lord, today. We just thank you for your word, and we just thank you for your love. We just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my kids are really proud of me because I brought my tablet to preach from. But if you have a if you have a real Bible like me, you can turn to First uh, Samuel chapter four. Uh, it'll be a minute before I get there, but at least then you'll be ready. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, pray one more time. Let's ask uh, the God of the Word to to bless. 
the word. Father, we come before you um, just as Samuel did. As he said, Lord, speak for your servant is listening. Right now we want to come before you as a congregation with that very same heart. God, as we've brought offering of our lives, as we've brought the, brought the offerings of, of uh, the tithe and, and the offering financially, God, as we've brought in uh, ourselves today to this time, we pray that you would speak for your people are listening. God, I pray that you'd help me to get out of uh, the way and that your word would come forth and your word would accomplish its purpose just as it's promised to always do. God, we pray for anointing on the word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, I was talking to my son John yesterday, and he told me that uh, the things that I do when I preach are, uh, number one, I'm not very funny. Uh, I would like to be funny. I can be funny for about three minutes, so please enjoy this portion of the message. <laughs> and then after that, not so much. Uh, start calm and end kind of not calm, so you can prepare yourself for that part of the sermon, uh, where we've shifted from funny to not calm. And then number three, uh, I like to ask good questions. I almost always talk about the fact that I'm an analyst, so I like to ask questions. I think that uh, asking the right questions is usually what gets us to the right answers. I think that uh, God uh, often asks the most incredible questions, uh, like, who do you say that I am? Adam, where are you? Uh, God asks these questions, son of man, will you prophesy? I mean, God really gets to the heart of the issue uh, and, and some of the most amazing things that God has ever said are questions. So I like to ask questions. And, um, and lastly, I am a homeschool dad, so I will be offering a lesson in physics today. So he likes physics. You and me, buddy. You and me. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we're going to start with physics, okay? Um, so I'm sure you're excited. Everybody, everybody say, yay, physics! Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> physics. Okay, the title of the message, now that we're all engaged in everything, the title of the message is Whole Life Offering. So since we're all engaged, turn to your neighbor and say, Whole Life Offering. If you are on the worship team, uh, you have heard me say Whole Life Offering a lot, okay? So for the last um, four months, uh, we've been having a devotional before we have our rehearsal in the morning, and uh, and we just go one verse per month because, you know, we have a lot of people, praise God, and so not everybody is up all the time, so I repeat myself. I just do the same devotion every single week for the month, and then I'll move on into one more verse. So we go one verse per month that, or, or one passage, something like that. But basically since November, I've been saying that worship is a whole life offering. Say that with me one more time again. Worship is is a whole life offering. Okay, it's really, really important that we start with the right definition, okay? Because if when we're talking about worship, you think that I'm talking about music specifically, we might not be speaking the same language, okay? So worship is a whole life offering. So, so what's the deal with music? We'll talk about it, okay? But, but, but understand the definition of worship, and this is another thing that I have said many, many times to the worship team, your most important contribution of worship is not musical. Not for a single person, not for me as the worship pastor, not for Canaan as a drummer, not for any person on this stage or off this stage. Your most important contribution, worship in your life, is not musical. Music is just one instrument of worship. Guys, it's already shifted. See, that was supposed to be funny. Music is an instrument of worship. <laughs> Thank you, Dreama. I, good, good. We're going to have to come up with like a signal for later. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to start with our physics lesson. Everybody's excited about that. Resonance. So I once, uh, I once had a... Uh, uh, I was ta having a conversation um, after uh, music time, and um, there was feedback. Have you ever been in uh, a musical performance, and the microphone or, or something on the sound system just starts going, Wah! 
ah, and then it like come becomes this huge piercing thing until somebody in the sound booth like <coughs> kills everything, right? So that's, that's feedback, right? So um, there are different things that can cause that kind of an effect, and you might be thinking of different things, but one of the things that perpetuates it is that uh, there's a, a some kind of a noise that gets caught in the, in the loop of the sound system, and so then a microphone or some instrument on the stage picks up that frequency of noise, and it starts generating the same noise, and then that just builds and builds and builds, because now it's even louder, and then, and then it has to be killed it has to it has to die um so so this is this is uh i was having a conversation and um a guy said said what causes that and i said well the uh in this case the bass was um picking up a resonant frequency okay and and so the guy who was at the soundboard um who was not an experienced sound man but was a physicist said um zach what what do you mean by this resonance can't do his accent very well. He was from Kenya. Uh, I could do it a lot better when, when we got together all the time. He said, what is resonance? But I love that resonant thing that he always did. So, um, so resonance is basically where a frequency, okay, frequency is, is literally what you, mean, what you think of when you mean frequency. It's how often does a thing occur, right? But in, in music, there are sound waves, and those waves um, can literally be visualized as going like this, right? This is a wave, and the frequency with which that wave repeats itself is uh, corresponding to, to the note that you hear. It's corresponding to the sound that you hear. So it, he it hits you in a frequency that, that your brain interprets as a noise, okay? So frequency uh, uh, is, is essentially the, the speed at which the sound occurred. So resonance, in physics, resonance describes the phenomena of amplification that occurs when the frequency of a periodically applied force is in harmonic proportion proportion to a natural frequency in the system on which it acts. And that's why everybody loves physics, because the definitions are so entertaining. In physics, resonance describes the phenomena of amplification. Amplification means uh, increase, right? So if, I w if I'm amplifying my voice with this microphone, we're taking the noise and we're getting it louder, right? So this is amplification. This system that we're applying is amplification, right? Amplification that occurs when the frequency of a periodically applied force, just means that I'm exposed to something that has a frequency, is in harmonic proportion to a natural frequency. So here's the other thing that you need to know about physics. It's that everything that exists in the world, without exception, is in motion. Okay, so we're all being acted on by various forces every day, but the atoms in our body, the very makeup of our being, is vibrating at a certain frequency. Okay, you can't see it, you can't feel it, but there's a vibration that's happening, there's a movement that's happening in who you are. And this is your natural frequency. And so we as humans, our natural frequency in a physical sense changes all the time, right? But we can, we can tune things to a specific natural frequency, right? So with the guitar, and I'm going to ask my sound man to turn this guitar back on just for a second. So with, with the guitar, oh, i got to have my volume. Okay, so we have determined that the way that this guitar is tuned is to specific frequencies for each string. Okay, so the variables that we control are like the length of the string and the, the, the depth of the string and, and what it's made out of. Some of them are bronze wound and some of them are not. So we've got this E, A, D, G, B, E thing going on, right? So the natural frequency of this note, of this string right now, the natural frequency, in other words, the thing that it's vibrating at all the time is an E frequency. Okay, so if this, this string were exposed, according to the, the law of resonance, if this string were exposed to the frequency of E without me plucking it, it would start generating that same noise. Do you hear that trail? After the pluck, there's a nice long trail of sound, right? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. This string, I'm going to stop plucking, okay? I'm going to pluck another string, and it's the same note, but then I'm going to let go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute this E string, and I'm going to pluck this other string so you can hear what that note sounds like when I mute it. 
You hear the silence when I mute it? Goes away, right? Okay, so now I'm going to unmute the E string. I'm going to play this other note on an E note, and then I'm going to mute it. So that, that E string picks up the resonant frequency. It picks up the frequency that it is naturally attuned to. Okay, so I promise this is going to go somewhere <laughs> meaningful. But the idea is that all items uh, uh, have a natural frequency at which they normally vibrate. And if they're exposed to the same frequency from some outside force on a periodic basis, in other words, it's, it's consistent, it's not just one bang, uh, then they will resonate. They will begin to sing that same note. They will begin to produce that same sound. They will begin to move in the same way. Okay? So now we're going to talk about worship. Okay? I want to talk about uh, some different people in the Old Testament. Okay? And, and what we're talking about is the ability to come into resonance with something, okay? We're going to talk about the power of resonance in our lives, okay? And now I'm going to shift from speaking about the physical and the natural to speaking about the supernatural. Becca prayed a bunch of things about coming into alignment. So there's a thing that can happen when we become attuned to the frequency of the Holy Spirit that is life transformational, okay? So we can be exposed. We can choose what forces are acting on us. We can choose what things are influencing our lives and our spirits and what types of things we are resonating with because we are not just natural uh, inanimate objects we choose how we move and live and breathe and in the spirit we have the choice what kind of things are going to resonate what kind of forces are we going to expose ourselves to and so I'm going to read from the Old Testament some of you may be going, oh, that's the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. But I just want to re read one verse from the New Testament, which is Romans 15 and verse 4. It says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. If you are one of these Christians who thinks, well, the Old Testament just is of no value to me, you may not be tapping into hope. Okay, scripture says that these things were written for us, for our instruction, so that we might have hope. So let's go to the Old Testament and let's get some hope today, okay? So I want to talk to you first about some people who had achieved a spiritual resonance. And I'm specifically going to key in on some things that mean worship or praise in the Bible, okay? We're going to talk about what those words mean. What does the Bible mean when it says that stuff? We're going to talk about some specific stuff that we do every week because you might have thought to yourself, why do we have a stage? Why do we have instruments? Why do we do music like the songs that we do and not different songs? Why don't we do the songs that I grew up with? Or why don't we do the songs that I've heard on for coming from California or Australia? Why don't we do my favorite personal song? Why don't we do the new song that I just heard on the radio? Why do we do the things that we do? And we don't do everything perfectly, but there are reasons for these choices. And our desire, again, is to be in resonance with the word and in resonance with the scripture. And so here's, here's my first example, and this is uh, found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And if you're a note taker, um, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> good job, Drina. Good. Uh, <laughs> I apologize up front because it is not going to be easy for you today, uh, but there will be so much good to be gained from it. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And verses 11 through 15, this is a, a king named Jehoshaphat, and he is uh, facing down armies that he cannot possibly face, and he knows it. It says in the scripture that he is uh, overwhelmed, and he prays to God. He says, we don't know what to do, but we come before you. And then the Lord sends a prophet to prophesy, and the prophet says to him, you will not have to fight this battle, but position yourself. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. 
And after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out ahead of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. And as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. In other words, at this time, God sent the word that said, You don't have to fight today. You just have to position yourself. You need to position yourself in the place of praise. Because victory belongs to the Lord. And there are some times where God calls us to take a specific action. There are some times where God is asking us to to, to come in and because he wants to reveal something different to us, right? So in this place where he says, you don't have to fight today, he's not revealing their authority. he's He's revealing their sonship. Okay, so sometimes God says, son, you don't have to fight this fight. I'm gonna fight this fight. I want you to know that you are my son today. And other times he says, he comes and he says, son, I want to reveal to you today that you have authority, that you can impact the earth. And so today, this is your fight. This is your action. You are going to go out there and you are going to take dominance over this situation because what you bind in earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on uh, the other way around, what you loose in heaven will be loosed in earth. So there are sometimes God is saying, listen, I want to reveal to you your sonship and I will fight the battle. And there are other times when God says, I want to reveal to you your authority and impact in the earth that I've released to you. And so it's time for you to act. So this time the Lord comes to Jehovah. And he says, you will not have to fight this battle. Only take up your position. Stand firm and see the deliverance which the Lord will give you. And then as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. If you were wondering why we sing, this could be a good enough reason because we sometimes need victory. Next example. 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. You can read the whole, uh, the whole bit. Same king comes to a prophet. The prophet's name is Elisha. Elisha is probably the greatest prophet who has ever lived, okay? Elijah was identified that way by God, and then God said that Elisha, who succeeded Elijah, had a double portion of his anointing, okay? So this is a guy who raised the dead. This is a guy who did Uh, miracles upon miracles. This is a guy who could speak and it was done. Okay, this is a great prophet. This is a man of God. But Jehoshaphat comes to him and he says, I need a word today. And Elisha says, frankly, you've been doing some bad things and I'm not really interested in giving you a word. However, because I'm obedient to the Lord, I'll give you one. But what I need right now, he says in verse 15, but now bring me a minstrel, a musician. And it came about when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him and he prophesied. So Elisha said, listen, I want to hear from God right now. I need to come into resonance with the spirit so that the gift that's in me can operate. So he said, bring me a musician. Because there's something, there's something about music that causes your frequency to resonate in a direction. You ever wonder why a, music, wh- why a movie with a really stupid plot can make you feel like crying? It's because about 10 minutes into that terrible situation that you're like, this, this has no, this doesn't make any sense. Why is she doing that? She knows better than that. He broke her heart. But in that moment, the strings come on, and you start to, and you're doing this number, and you're feeling some feelings. That's because of the music. The music can completely change a moment. That's why that's why we 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 have uh, music a lot of the time. I tell Gabriel, my son who plays the piano over here, give me a little. You'll see me give give him a little symbol. I'll tell him, you know, give me give me a G chord right now. It will come in on the keys, you know, and then you just start to feel a certain thing. And and there are people in the world who right now would be like, um, that's the flesh. Okay, so you're stirring up people's flesh. That is emotionalism. Okay, Um, but what I'm going to suggest is that it's just biblical. 
okay, Elisha, this great prophet and man of God, said, okay, I will give you a word. Bring me a musician. Okay, so if I have to do that, I'm sorry. I'm just not quite better than Elisha. That's all there is to it. So next one is David. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 23. And uh, at this time in, in, in Saul's life, Saul is the king of Israel, and Saul is afflicted by a demonic spirit, okay? So uh, periodically, it wasn't all the time, but periodically a demonic spirit would come and afflict Saul, and he became uh, murderous in rage. He would just go off the handle. He would actually try and kill people who were around him. He was afflicted, according to Scripture, by a demon. Okay, so they recruit David, who's this uh, young guy. He's not a king yet. He's not well known yet. They just recruit this guy. He has already slain Goliath, so there's all this, and he's got some stuff going on. But then he just goes back to the shepherd field, right? So they, they bring him back, and they say, okay, when Saul becomes afflicted by the demon, you go ahead and play some music. And it says in verse 23, it came about whenever the evil spirit came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. <sighs> I'm just reading the word to you guys. This is the power of the Lord who anoints a moment in music. It's not because we want to stir up the flesh. It's exactly the opposite. We want to stir up the spirit. We want to come into resonance with the Spirit. We want to attune ourselves to what the Lord and what the Spirit is doing. Okay, so Psalm 102, verses 18 through 22. And I love this one, and we're going to read a lot of Psalm stuff here in a minute. But Psalm 102, verses 18 through 22, it says, This will be written for the generations to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord gazed upon the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to set free those who were doomed to death. That men may tell of the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord, lift up a shout of praise. Now let me read it again with just a little pause in the middle, okay? This will be written uh, for the generations to come that a people yet to be created may praise. Everybody say praise. praise. May praise the Lord. For he looked down from his holy height from heaven. The Lord gazed upon the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner and to set free those who were doomed to death. In other words, according to the scripture, God said, let there be praise in the earth so that the prisoner will be set free. There is a direct connection between whether or not you are offering the praise that God desires from you and whether or not the prisoner is being set free. Sometimes you are that prisoner. There is a direct connection not only between the gospel, but, but listen, listen. The next verse says that men may tell of the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. In other words, there is a direct connection between your praise and your evangelistic efforts. There is a direct connection between whether or not you are praising Jesus and whether or not you are sharing Jesus. So as God said, let it be written down so that men all over the earth may praise the Lord so that the prisoner will be set free and so that his mighty deeds will be proclaimed in the earth. These two things are directly connected to praise. I love a song that came out about 15 years ago uh, by, by Matt Redman. And it said, let worship be the fuel for mission's flame. We're going with a passion for your name. We're going for we care about your praise. Send us up. In other words, as we worship, the one whom we worship will stir up in our hearts the flame of evangelism. Let worship be the fuel for mission's flame. And then the second verse turns it around. It says, let worship be the heart of mission's aim. To see the nations recognize your name. To every tribe and tongue voices your praise. Send us out. In other words, as we evangelize, the gospel is proclaimed and God receives the glory. There is a cyclical nature of this frequency as we come into the place of worship everybody tell me what worship was again was it whole life 
offering. Yeah, as we come into the place of worship with a whole life offering, the name of Jesus is exalted upon the earth and the proclamation of his gospel is powerful and effective to raise up worshipers. So this is what happens when we're in resonance with the spirit. Now, I want to talk. Uh, Psalm 23, 22, verse 3. It says, yet you are holy, you who are enthroned upon the praises of your people. Scripture says, not Zach, Scripture says that God is enthroned upon the praises of his people. You might be listening and thinking, well, if worship is a whole life offering, I don't need to be in church to do that. And that is correct. In fact, the majority of your whole life offering will be spent in another place than a church. However, the scripture says that as we gather together, I mean, not only do we have the promise, Jesus said, I'll never leave nor forsake you. That's an individual promise for every believer. So if you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, he says, I will never leave nor forsake you. You have the promise of his presence in your life. And yet, Jesus also makes the promise that whenever two or more are gathered in his name, there he will be in the midst of them. We have an amplifying effect as we expose ourselves to other believers who are worshiping. And this scripture says that God is enthroned on the praises of his people. See, you can do all kinds of ministry and never have any effect if God is not in the midst of the ministry. Okay, so what we need is Jesus in the midst of this. I mean, Moses on the mountain was speaking with God, the father, and he and the father said to him, listen, I'm going to send you. I'm going to give you the promises. I'm going to give you the promised land. I'm going to give you hand, houses to live in. I'm going to give you vineyards to farm. I'm going to give you every good thing. But my presence is not going. And Moses said, no, no, if your presence is not going, do not send us up. I am not going without the presence of God. In other words, even if you had all of those effects, if Jesus is not present, this is not even a church. As we gather in his name, we have the promise that he will be here in the midst of us. And so sometimes we get confused about what kind of things we need. See, peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 uh, verse 6 says his name shall be called everlasting father, prince of peace. See, peace is not when all the bad things get eliminated. It's when Jesus shows up. And in the same way, health is not the absence of illness. Health is not the absence of injury. Health is the presence of the son of righteousness. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2 says, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. See, what we need is not just for God to break the power of an illness, to break the power of an affliction. We need God to show up in his person. We need Jesus to arise with healing in his wings. And in the same way, joy is not the absence of anxiety or sadness or depression. Joy is in the presence of the Lord. According to Psalm verse 16, verse 11, it says, In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So sometimes we can get distracted by seeking the things instead of the one that we need in the midst of our situation. That's why we come before God today and we say, I'm not here for blessings. I just want to worship at your throne. I just want you. Nothing else. Because nothing else is good enough. So I do want to talk about dissonance. Resonance is a a phenomenon in physics in which a repeated force acts upon another object at a harmonious frequency to its natural frequency. Dissonance is when two frequencies are not harmonious. This is not a physics term. This is a music term. So if I sing a bum note, it might be that that note is dissonant to the one that I was supposed to sing. Okay, that means that they're at tension with each other. And so now we're going to come to 1 Samuel 4. Thank you for those of you who have been waiting patiently and eagerly. 
for first Samuel. Those of you who had re- who had real Bible. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> So 1 Samuel chapter 4, and uh, we will start uh, at, at verse 1. Thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Oh, started with the word thus. Mm. So sometimes when you're reading the scripture and you start with uh, a chapter of the Bible and it starts with a word like therefore or thus or after these things, uh, and you just kind of breeze right by that, you might miss something that happened, okay? So uh, especially if it's a therefore, like uh, later we're going to read uh, Romans chapter 12, and, and it starts with, therefore, I urge you. And, uh, and, and you might want to ask yourself, what is that therefore, therefore? Um, the idea, <laughs> there you go, <laughs> delayed effect. Thus, okay, so how did Samuel's word come to all of Israel? Um, the story preceding this, uh, Samuel was devoted to God by his mother as a small child. The Samuel is raised in the temple. So after he was weaned, he was taken to the temple uh, to live there. And he was raised by the priest. The high priest's name was uh, Eli, and his sons were named uh, Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, the problem was that at that time, um, God was very dissatisfied with the ministry. Okay? God uh, said to Samuel, in the verses right before this, God said to Samuel, um, and, and actually Samuel was laying in a special place. Um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the Ark of the Covenant, but we're going to talk about it. But the Ark of the Covenant was a box, a physical, literal, actual box that contained some items that were representative of God's promise. And, and God actually said to make this box, okay? And God said, I will make my presence basically by this box, okay? You can come to the box and find me there, he told the people of Israel. So uh, it's also called the Ark of His Presence, okay? So the Ark of the Covenant is kept in a special place where the priests would come in and they would minister. Well, Samuel was a, a, a young boy. He was, I don't know, 7, 10, 12, I don't know. Uh, but he was serving in the temple, and, uh, and he actually, it says in that previous chapter that he was laying in the presence next to the box. He was next to the Ark of the Covenant, so he was laying in the presence of God. I love that picture because sometimes you just need to rest in the presence of God. If, if you're finding yourself at dissonance with the Holy Spirit, sometimes you just need to rest in the presence. And so Samuel's in that place, and the voice of the Lord came to him, and the word says that, that uh, at that time the, the voice of the Lord was infrequent. People were not familiar with the voice of the Lord. And, and so that's your first clue that there was something wrong with the, ministry, with the ministry. But Samuel doesn't know what's going on. Eli says to him, well, say to him, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. And God speaks in response to Samuel saying, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, and gives a prophecy. He says, I am very unhappy with the ministry. That's the, you know, New Zach version. So he says uh, what the priests are doing is taking the best of the offering for themselves. And so um, this, is, this is a pattern in Scripture, actually. Um, when the priority of worship shifts, people start to draw toward themselves. Okay, and this can happen on a stage if you get prideful. This can happen uh, in in the in the pew. If uh, if you start to say to yourself, um, you know, why do we do all this stuff? It, it could be because you're you're just curious, right? But it could also be because you don't want to make the investment, right? Because uh, maybe it makes you feel uncomfortable to to raise your hands or to sing a song with your neighbor, and uh, you know, maybe you don't have any formal training or you're afraid of your voice squeaking or some kind of thing like that maybe maybe you just don't like it right but as your priority shifts it starts to become about you and so that's what was happening right there so now we're going to actually read thus the word of samuel came to all of israel samuel delivered that prophecy now israel went out to meet the philistines in battle and camped against ebenezer while the philistines camped in aphek the Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel, and when it, the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines. Okay, you're with me so far? An opposing army came, they defeated Israel. When the people came into the camp, the elders, elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today? 
before the Philistines. Let, let us, they, see, they had a good idea. They said, why has the Lord defeated us today? As though they didn't just hear in like the previous verse what God was unhappy about. So now they're going to they're say, why did God defeat us today before the Philistines? I have an idea. Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. And so here again, the focus has been shifted. The, the, the Ark of the Covenant is in Shiloh. They say to themselves, we're going to bring the presence of God in so that we might have victory. Okay, so if you shift, if you, and this happens uh, among Christians who are very devoted, if you become shifted in your, in your devotional life, in your worship life, everybody say whole life offering. If you become, if you shift in your offering time from, from maybe bringing God your offering to the things that I need, then instead of becoming transformed in his presence, you begin to monitor outcomes to find out if you got what you wanted. Right And worship, your actual interaction with Jesus can become a transaction where you're trying to get something in exchange for something, and that's not how God works. Victory is a byproduct. It is not the end product, okay? Victory is a byproduct of our relationship with Jesus when we give a whole life offering. And so the, the priests said to themselves, let's get the Ark of the Covenant so that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who sits above the cherubim. The cherubim were like uh, angels that were in a, on little statues on the corners of the Ark. And so, who sits enthroned above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, remember, these are the priests that God didn't like, Hophni and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth resounded. It sounded really good. The Ark of the Covenant where God promised his presence would be came into the camp and the people of Israel were excited about it and they lifted up a voice. They lifted up a shout of victory. But there's one problem. There is a word, there is a Hebrew word that is translated shout in scripture that means worship, but this is not it. This is a different sound. This is the sound of victory without the sound of worship. And so this shout came in and it sounded good. And the Philistines heard the noise of the shout. They said, what does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. It looked good, too. See, those people who were not even God worshipers heard the shout and they perceived that the presence of God had come into the camp and they become afraid. They said in verse eight, woe to us who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods. These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues and wilderness. Take courage and be men. And this is where the shift occurred because they had the voice of victory without the voice of worship. When they engaged the enemy, it was not enough because they weren't driven away. They said, take courage and be men or you will become slaves of the Hebrews as they have been slaves to you. Therefore, be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. And verse 11, the ark of God was taken. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Those two priests. And now a man from Benjamin ran from the battle line. And we're going we're gonna to jump down in just a second here. But a man runs from the battle to Eli, the high priest. And, he, and, he, uh, and, and Eli immediately responds. And he says, he hears the man approaching. And just like the Philistine said, what is this sound that I hear? But it wasn't the sound that the people of Israel needed. Eli says, what is the sound of this commotion? And the messenger says, this is because your two sons have died and the Ark of the Covenant has been taken. And it says in verse 18, when he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backward beside the gate and the neck, his neck was broken and he died. Verse 19, the next verse says, Now his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, remember her husband just died, was pregnant and about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband had died, she kneeled down and gave birth, for her pains come upon her. And about the time of the death, of her death, the women who stood by her said, Do not be afraid, for you have given birth to a son. So in other words, she died giving birth. 
but she didn't pay attention when they tried to comfort her by saying that she had given birth to a son. She said in verse 21, she called the, vo the boy Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord has departed. She called him Ichabod, saying the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband, she said the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark was taken. And so I imagine Samuel in his heart sort of carrying around this fact that as a small boy he had to prophesy he had to stand against his own leadership. He had to see the Ark of the Covenant where he used to find that place of rest and resonance taken away. And the Ark of God after that, if you read the next couple of chapters, it goes into the Philistines take it and they put it in, in, a, in a temple to another god. But the problem is that God is not satisfied with, with being in a box. Okay, So although he promised to be near the box, he wasn't going to be kept by a box. Okay, so the Ark of the Covenant goes into this temple and these statues of the other th of the other gods begin to fall down and break. And so the, the people, the priests of this temple are like, this is weird stuff. We need the box in another place. They send it to another city. And then when the Ark gets to that city, those people begin to break out in tumors. OK, so everybody suddenly got cancer. So now they're like, I don't know what's going on, but we can't keep the box either. OK, so they come up with a plan. They take the, the Ark. And they put it on, a, uh, on the back of two milk cows, two heifers. And they send it out down the road toward Israel. And then they just kind of watch it because they're afraid. They don't know what to do with this box that's killing everybody. Like this is some kind of horror movie. There's a box and it's killing people, okay? So they're like watching the box go down the street. They follow it until it gets into the hands of Israel. And then they're like, all right, we're done with the box. No more problems, right? So then the ark essentially is returned to Israel, but not to the priesthood. And it goes and it kind of finds this little place to hang out. And Israel goes on. And Samuel goes on, prophesying to, to the people of Israel and declaring judgment. And, uh, and Saul, the king, is raised up, and then Saul essentially falls down. And then David is raised up as king in his uh, succession. And then it, it occurs to David, and we're going to go in 2 Samuel chapter 6. It occurs to David, and I like to think of both Samuel and David sort of remembering this moment. And this person who was probably present in life. Because this was, remember, a, a priest's wife. This was the high priest's daughter-in-law's son. So this was probably a person who was familiar to sort of the court of Israel, right? All the kings and all the religious, this, uh, 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 the, the system of the day would have said that this is a person who is present and probably fairly well-to-do and important in the life of Israel. And so this person, who we never hear from a God again, his name is Ichabod, and he is a constant reminder for both Samuel and David that there was a time when the presence of God dwelt among us. There was a time when the ark was in our midst. And so David says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, it says, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah, which is where the ark went, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned ab above the cherubim. And they placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzziah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. And so basically what they did was they were like, well, it came to us on the back of two milk cows. So let's build a cart and let's follow that same pattern. It worked out for the Philistines. right? And so sometimes what can happen in ministry or, or in worship is that we're like, you know, it's working for the world. So maybe we should try the same thing. But the problem is when we apply the pattern of the world instead of the pattern of God, we become dissonant with his word. And so this is what happened. They put it on the back of a cart and then it's coming down the road. And it says, so they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Benadab. Uh, da, 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 da. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyre, harp, tambourine, castanets, and cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, 
So this is a threshing floor. A threshing floor is where the uh, harvest would come into a special place where it would be separated. The worthless part, the chaff that stems and uh, worthless part of the wheat, for example, from the, the seeds and the, and, the, and the fruit of the harvest. So the threshing floor was a place where the worthless was separated from the valuable. And when they reached this place, through no cause that was uh, natural, the ark became unsettled. And so when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, the ark became unsettled. And it says Uzzah, this is a guy, his name was Uzzah, reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen had nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah. And God struck him down there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. It seemed like a good idea. I mean, the, uh, the box was about to fall over. Like, we're all focused on bringing this thing back. We're all focused on doing the right thing right now. And it's about to break. So he reached out his hand to catch it. The problem is that God never intended for a human hand to touch the ark. Because God said, my glory I share with no man. And so God, when he gave instructions about how to transport the ark, when he said, build the ark, he said, put rings on the corners of it and put poles through the rings. And the only people who can carry this, this ark are, people, are the priests. And they're to put it on their shoulders and carry it with a pole that's through those rings. And so the thing that happened when David tried to bring the presence of God back in is that they tried to put it on a human-made machine. They tried to employ the means of men. See, God's presence was never meant to be carried by anything but people. And so the ark was representative of God's presence. And he said, I will come and meet with you there. But the uh, box did not contain God. The box was a place where men could carry his presence, where men could interact with the present and living God. And so as they went through and the ark was put on the back of these animals in a cart, it began to shift when it reached the place where things were separated, the worthless from the holy, the worthless from those that, things that had value. And as it, as it entered that place, the ark became unsettled, and he reached out, and instead of God, touching God in the prescribed manner, he grabbed the ark, and God struck him dead. So there is a very holy reverence that should be associated with the presence of God. And so David was afraid. Verse 9. He said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. I really like Obed-Edom, the Gittite. I don't know anything about him, but I know that when the entire nation of Israel has spent a period without the voice of God, without the presence of God, without the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. When the entire nation of Israel goes, we're going to bring it back in, and then bad things happen. You know, Philistines are having tumors, and they're having uh, problems in the temple, and David comes to bring back the, the, the Ark, and it's going to fall over, and Uzzah is struck dead. And, and so people are like, I don't know what to do with this. But, the, but they said to themselves, you know who can steward the presence of God? There's a guy named Obed-Edom. Let's send the ark to his house. I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that when the rest of the world doesn't know what to do with the presence of God, if the rest of the world is in dissonance with the Holy Spirit, if the rest of the world does not know how to come into resonance with the word of God, I want to be that guy who they can say, listen, he knows how to steward the presence of God. I want us to be a church that no matter what is going on in the world around us, and there are promises of terrible things in the world around us, but no matter what is going on, good or bad, they can say that church is a place that knows how to steward the presence of God. And so in that period of time, it says that the ark went to the house of Obed-Edom, and thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. 
And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. See, this is the opposite, right? They were in dissonance and they experienced the fruit of dissonance. And so Obed-Edom is in resonance with the presence of God. And he experiences blessing in everything that he does. And so now in verse 12, it says, It would told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on the account of the ark of God. And David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness because he saw that he could interact, that, that it was possible. That's the other thing that I want for us, church. I want people to be able to walk into these doors and see that it's possible to steward the presence of God, to resonate in the presence of God with that frequency of heaven. So David saw it, and he said, look, it's working for Obed. We just need to figure out the pattern. We just need to go back and do it the way God said to do it. And then we'll come back into resonance. And so it was when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. And now they've got the bearers. They went back to the pattern. That's all. When they had gone six paces, they stopped. Because now David's got reverence. And he sacrificed an ox and a fat lamb. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of trumpet. And then it happened, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And this is kind of a little bit of a sidetrack, right? But this is another pattern in Scripture. Okay? So Michael was David's wife, and for some reason, she saw what was happening, and what she said was that she was jealous because he was in, in, in linens, and, and some other women were going to see him, and he was not being uh, dignified before them, like he was maybe flirting or whatever, right? Uh, but I don't, know what the, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what the real reason is, right? That could be it, um, but what I know is that there is a pattern in Scripture when you become resonant with the things of God, you also at that same time become dissonant with other things. And sometimes you have to live in a place of dissonance. In fact, as long as you are in this earth, you will have to live in a place of dissonance with some things in order to be in resonance with the Holy Spirit. And so, verse 17, they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And so from this moment on, the presence of God is restored. And, and there is a pattern in David's life where when he faces difficulty, when he faces situations, it says he goes, and this is a, a very frequent phrase in the Bible in relationship to David's life. It says that he inquired of the Lord. Okay, so I got about eight slides that we're about to do. And these eight slides are words that mean praise in Hebrew. Okay, these are things that uh, are translated as praise or worship in the Old Testament. Okay, so all we're going to do, we're going to read the Bible and see what it says about worship. Okay, because I mentioned that people have all these questions about worship. What about amplification? What about the instruments that we use? What about the songs that we play? Should those people be on the stage? Should there even be a stage? We're just going to see if the scripture has anything to say about it. Okay, so anybody familiar with the book of Psalms? Okay, so 40,000 words in the Bible written about worship. Okay, 40,000 words in the book of Psalms. If you're interested, there's a lot written about worship. But we're just going to look at some words that are translated to mean worship or praise in the Bible. First one is the word halal. Halal is the word that from which we derive the English word hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yah is shortened for Yahweh, the proper name of God, according to, the, to the, uh, how he revealed himself to Moses. So halal, hallelujah means halal yah, right? To, and it means to be clear, to praise, to shine, to boast, to rave, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. Hallelujah. This is also my son John's favorite 
translation of the word worship. He says, Dad, I'm really good at that one. <coughs> uh, this is also a word that is translated as madness when David pretended to be crazy in, uh, in the house of a king that wanted to kill him. And so there's a couple of verses here. Uh, Psalm 113 verse 1 says, praise the Lord, praise, O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Psalm 150 verse 1 says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. If you were wondering whether or not it's biblical to come to church, you should praise God in his sanctuary. If you were wondering, should I participate in the portion of the service where we are lifting up one voice to praise God? This is what the scripture says. I'm just reading it. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. The next word, oh, no, 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 no. Psalm 149, verse 3 says, Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. If you were wondering if dancing is biblical, the scripture says, Let them praise his name with dancing. It's that simple. Should we have music? Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. I do not have a theology degree. But I am pretty sure that let them do it means yes, let's go for it. <laughs> Next word is yada. Yada is a verb with a root meaning the extended hand. To throw out the hand and therefore to worship with extended hand, to lift the hands. The opposite me meaning, uh, according to the, the Hebrew lexicon, is to bemoan the wringing of the hand. So it essentially... This is one of the reasons why this is worship is because this is anxiety. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 21. When he consulted the pe with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. <laughs> what you wear man matters. Praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army the, and said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. This is the verse we read earlier where God himself came and said, you don't have to fight this one. Instead, you watch and I'll have the victory. This is what they did. They yachted. Hands up. Uh, Psalm 63 verse 1 says, so I will bless thee as long as I live. I will lift my hands in thy name. Pretty straightforward. Psalm 107 verse 6. Verse 15 says, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. So this is my offering that says, God, you are good. This is my my praise that says, God, you deserve my worship. And what's worship? Everybody say whole life offering. You deserve that. Next word is tauda. It means confession, a thank offering or sacrifice. This word is also representative of liturgical worship. I'm sorry if you're a person who doesn't like liturgical church. Um, I also enjoy enthusiasm, but there is also value scripturally from repeated action. This is why I come and I say worship is whole life offering. Worship is whole life offering. Worship is whole life offering because as I unite faith and this is the importance of the liturgical church is that if you go in and it's dead it's not because it's liturgical it's because there is not faith in the house and so we can be just as faithless right here and so this is what this is what it says it says it's a thank offering so if if yada was this one that says god you're good then tauda is god i don't feel like it's good right now Maybe I don't even feel like you're good right now, but this is my thank offering. This is my praise for the thing I have not received yet. This is my thank you for the thing that has yet to become. So Psalm 50 verses four, verse 14 says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high. And in verse 23, it says, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. The Lord. The next word is Shabak. It means to shout, to address in a loud tone, to command, to triumph, to laud, commend, or congratulate. Psalm 47 and verse 1, it says, Oh, clap your hands. You know when the worship team is up here and they're doing this? They're trying to get you to clap because it's biblical. So here's the thing. 
You can't. Here's the amazing thing about music. I told you about how that music impacts you when you're just being passive to it, right? When you're just observing it, you can still be impacted it because, by it because it, be, it brings your emotions and it brings your spirit into resonance with a certain thing. But when you worship, when you gather in the name of Jesus in the presence of God, and when you engage your body by raising your hands, by clapping your hands, by dancing, why does God say to do that? Because it brings you into alignment with him. Because it brings you into alignment with his word and with his person, and it brings you into resonance with his presence. And so God says, clap your hands, people. Shout to God with the voice of joy. If you are wondering why sometimes it gets loud, it's because it's biblical. It's because we are shouting. We have a loud voice of praise. And so this is the word that should have been when the Ark of the Covenant came into the, uh, the camp of the Israelites. When it said that they shouted and the earth shook, this is the word that should have been there. Instead of the shout of victory and, tri and triumph in battle, it should have been the shout of praise. This is the verse, this is the, this is the word that you should have, this is the offering that you should be bringing. Clap your hands, shout to God with a voice of joy. The next word is Barak. To kneel down, to prostrate, to offer oneself in obedience to a superior. Ooh, some people don't like that word, obedience. This is one of the words that means worship. And in uh, uh, Psalm 95, verse 6, it says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. This is the word that says, God, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. They bowed down. Next word is zamar. Zamar means to pluck the strings of an instrument, to sing, to praise, to make music. We already talked about music, but Psalm 21, verse 13 says, Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 9 says, Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders. In other words, this word of music, the musical worship of God, is directly tied to his power and his wonders. So that's why I say, as we come into resonance with just music, with just aligning ourselves by singing a song and by getting physically engaged in worship, it is just biblical that his power is mobilized on our behalf. This is what it says. It just says, be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing praise. We will sing and praise your power. Next word is tehillah, to sing, to glorify with music. Yet you are holy, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Remember when I said that God's presence is promised to the people as they gather together in his name. And remember when I said that as we gather and we lift up praise in song, it's, it's when God is enthroned upon the praises of his people. This is where it says, come and sing. It do Here, let me. It doesn't say sing well. <laughs> it just says sing. It doesn't matter. Because as we come into resonance, He's enthroned on the praises of his people. In Isaiah 61, verse 3 says, Grant to those who mourn in Zion, Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting. Spirit of praise instead of fainting. Singing is a place where we make the exchange. So sometimes if you need to make an exchange of not a transaction, what I do for what he does, but if I want to bring something and leave it at the feet of the cross and God can give me what he wants me to have instead, sometimes you just need to sing. I just do. And before we go to the next word, we're going we're gonna to stay here for just a second. I want to tell you a story. And, uh, and then we're going to do, uh, I'm going to give you one more word. We're going to go to Romans chapter 12 and we'll be done. <laughs> uh, my son, Gabriel. This guy, that's this. Uh, he he's becoming resonant, okay. Uh, when he was uh, two years old, and uh, he started learning everybody's names. <laughs> I was like, "What are you talking about?" 
He was one. He's one. He's learning the people in our lives' names, right? So he says, Dad, Dad. He says, Mama. He's starting to pick up people's names, right? And so he goes, um, he says, you know, this is, this is Charlie, and this is um, Jackie. And um, the one of my wife's best friends, her name is Carrie, um, and she was a worship leader at our church. And uh, she was, uh, you know, the best friend. She's in our life. She's all the time there, right? And, uh, and Gabriel decided that her name was Shaha. So um, he would go around the room, and, and you, would, you could ask him, like, uh, who's this? That's Dada. Who's this? That's Mama. Who's this? That's Jackie. Who's this? That's Shaka. And this really bugged Carrie for a long time because Carrie and Shaka don't exactly sound alike. And she didn't think that it sounded like a pretty name. But, uh, but Gabriel just decided that her name was Shaka. And... Uh, and so he was one. Um, he also, uh, he had a name for, for my mom. Uh, her name was Bubba. <laughs> she loved that. <laughs> she tried to get her grandma, Bubba, right? Uh, so come to find out, uh, I don't know if you know anybody who's Jewish, but uh, Bubba is Yiddish for grandma. Uh, they'll, call, they'll call grandma Bubba or Bubbala. Um, and, uh, and Shaka is our next word. It means worship in Hebrew. We can flip the slide. Shaka, and this is, this is where we're trying to land, okay? So we talked about, and we just read a bunch of verses about worship. And if you had any questions, oh, I never mentioned the stage. He had questions about this stuff. You can read about the stage in uh, Ezra, uh, no, Nehemiah chapter 8. <coughs> If you had questions about how we do worship, okay, I hope that you've seen some answers from Scripture. And the thing is, we're not going to get it perfect, but we're going to do what we can to be in resonance with God, okay? And so I do want you to know that we are intentional about the songs that we sing. We're intentional about the way that we, that, that we sing them. We're intentional about the musical portion, but we also know that worship is... A whole life offering, right? But when we come together, we can be in resonance all together in the presence of God. So we talked about singing. We talked about bowing. We talked about prostrating oneself. We talked about the sacrifice of praise, the raising of our hands. We talked about dancing. We talked about uh, uh, lit liturgy. But this is a big one. Shaka means to prostrate oneself to fall down, to bow, to surrender. See, if you haven't surrendered to Jesus, then you're not going to do the rest of it in resonance. Dave, can you give me some piano? We're going to have a moment. So, uh, Shaka means to bow down to surrender, and it says, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, and this is the very first word translated worship in the Bible, and it's talking about Abraham. It said, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. And so Abraham was coming into the presence of, uh, of God to bring his, his all, his surrender, his his offering of worship of his entire person. And this is what this is what the scripture says that that he brought. Shaka. And in verse uh, Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14, it says, You shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. You've heard that God has different names, it refers to him in different ways, and each name of God. It doesn't mean that he was different people or personalities, but each name re reveals something about himself to us, right? Um, it's like, uh, my name is Zach, but my children call me dad, right? And so one of the names of God is the name of God is jealous. Do you know the difference between envy and jealousy? Envy means I want what others have. Jealousy means I want what's mine. Jealousy is when I'm concerned because my wife, who, who is committed to me, may, you know, uh, th this is my wife. I become jealous over her affection. 
right? Envy is when I want what, what belongs to someone else. The Lord never experiences envy. But the Lord's name is jealous because you belong to him. And so this is what it says. It says, you shall, worship, you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Remember when I told you at the beginning of this message that there is a resonant frequency, there is a natural frequency at which every inanimate object rests. In other words, it's moving in a certain direction at all times because it's moving in a certain way at all times. It's like a vibration. And when the frequency is applied to it, a resonant frequency, that that natural frequency is amplified okay an e string naturally resonate or naturally emits the frequency of e your natural frequency is worship romans chapter 12 oops it starts with therefore romans chapter 11 Verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who can become his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. In other words, everything belongs to God. And so here we are. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. You belong to Jesus and your natural frequency is worship. And so what I want to encourage you to do is to point that worship in the right direction. And again, now I'm not talking about music. I am talking about a whole life offering. That this is what I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. And maybe you're walked into here today and you heard all these things and you're like, yeah, that's great, Zach, but I'm not a great man of faith. That's great that you're talking about resonance and how we can oppose the world, but I haven't been doing that. Maybe you walked in here today and you feel like, but the thing that I have to give my whole life, it's not what God wants. It's not the kind of life that God wants. I know that I've been in dissonance with God. And that's why it says, I urge you by his mercy to offer yourselves as living sacrifices to the one for from whom and through whom and to whom are all things. Church, would you stand up on your feet for just a minute? And uh, we're going to, um, we're, we're just going to, we're going to take a minute. Gabe, keep, keep going. And uh, I'm just going to pray a prayer, okay? And uh, if you would like to come forward, that's fine. Uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, I, I, I want to bow, I want to sing, I want to dance, I want to clap. Whatever those things are, those are biblical things to do, right? Listen to the Holy Spirit. I would invite you to come forward because there is something that happens when you, when you take action sometimes. But what I want to do right now, I'm just going to pray. I don't know, 30 seconds, a minute. Sometimes I pray kind of long, sometimes not. So if you're eager to make a, a tra a, a, an exchange, that bow down kind of one, then be quick about it because I don't know if it's going to be long, but I'm just going to pray. And uh, my encouragement to you is to enter into that shaka kind of worship, enter into that whole life offering kind of worship, to take the worship that naturally exists in your spirit and point it in the right direction and come into resonance with the word of God right now. And if God needs to change your mind about something, ask him to change your mind. If God needs to change your patterns of behavior about something, ask him to change your patterns of behavior. If God needs to change the way you feel in your emotions, ask him to change your emotions. What I want you to do right now is to come before the throne of grace in a place of worship. That everything, whether it's my mind, my will, my emotions, my spirit, my life, my abilities, my fears, the way that I live, the way that I interact in my family, the things that I do, my patterns of behavior, whatever those things are, just bring all of them into the presence of God right now. 
And let us, as a, as a congregation, say, God, we belong to you. And let it be done to your people according to your word in the name of Jesus. If you want to move, move. Now's your time. I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you that you have called us to worship. Father, I thank you that you've given to us a holy calling, that you've given to us the ability to enter into your presence with confidence by the blood of Jesus and by the name of Jesus and by the sacrifice of his cross because he first gave his all for us. God, I thank you that your power is enough to break every stronghold and to change our circumstances, our behaviors, our thought patterns, our emotions. God, I thank you that your, your power and your spirit are alive and active and that you will accomplish your purpose in the world. God, I thank you that right now, you have given to us sonship and authority, that right now there are things in this room that you've said, son, you don't have to fight that fight. But position yourself in a place of worship. God, I thank you that there are things in this room that you are releasing power through the Holy Spirit to break and to change and to affect. God, I thank you that you've given to your people the power to, do, to express dominion in the earth, to, uh, to express the power of the name of Jesus. And God... Though I thank you for all these things, I want to leave them aside and offer myself to you. God, I lift up this church to you, not because of what you'll do for us, not because of what you'll do through us, not because of anything that you'll do at all, but because God, full stop. Receive this church as an offering, a whole life offering. Father, may it be done in this place and in our lives. May it be done to your people according to your word. In Jesus' name.